We're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Monday, and we are starting a very interesting week. Um, this is um, Marco, Mina, and me on Monday. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called Remarkable Energy Apocalypse in the 2017 session. Now what? And we're going to talk about lots of contention in the closing days. We're going to address the issue of whether this was not a good year for energy in the legislature. If you want to ask a question or participate in the discussion, you can reach us at ThinkTechHI on Twitter or call us at 415-871-2474. Our guests for the show, of course, are Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar and Hilo and Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC and now operating Energy Dynamics. Now, two interesting things happened in the 2017 session. The failure of, of a lot of energy bills, important ones, and the failure to confirm Tom Gorak as a commissioner of the PUC, pursuant to the appointment made by David Ige, oh, back in June, I think. So welcome to the show, Marco and Mina. Great to have you here. Hi, Jay. How are you doing? Better since I saw you last Wednesday. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Mina was on not one but two energy shows I, Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> it becomes an official so co-host. I, I thought you'd be tired of my voice by now. <laughs> <laughs> and Marco, how are you? Well, greetings and uh, comradely salutations from the great Republic of California, hopefully someday to become the People's Republic of California. Oh. Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii once we split off from the United States and form a more perfect <laughs> union of like-minded states. That'd be right after the earthquake, you know. <laughs> well, let's talk about the 2017 session. A lot of disappointment for a lot of, from a lot of quarters. We've talked to a number of people about their you know, their areas of interest and the, the bills they were following and, um, you know, and what happened there. But uh, energy, we haven't really talked to you guys about energy and what happened in the session. We talked to some extent, I guess, Mina, we talked to you on, on Wednesday about it. But let's, let's uh, talk about two separate things. The first thing is, and it's really important, is what happened to the bills? What bills were pending and what happened to them, it's especially the battery bill? Well, I'm, I'm most familiar with uh, what started out as House Bill 1593, if I'm not mistaken, 1593, that was uh, a bill that would have done a, a couple of important things that would have modified and I believe ramped down the renewable energy tax credit over time. And it would also have provided state support for battery storage, for energy storage. And there were differences in the House bill and what was modified in the Senate. So you had a, uh, the conference committee at the end of the session led by the um, uh, Chris Lee on the House side, uh, Mina's successor in the House Energy and Environment Committee. And then I believe it was Ros Baker, was it Ros Baker, Senator Ros Baker or Senator uh, Lorena Noe uh, on the Senate side. And uh, unfortunately for the second year in a row, uh, there was uh, you know meltdown on the conference committee that uh, didn't allow any energy bills to uh, to see the light of day. So rather disappointing, I, I'd say, to uh, to folks uh, in my line of business who are hoping for some uh, additional state support uh, in the form of uh, maybe taking some of the money out of the GEMS fund, which has been uh, underwhelming in terms of the, uh, the, the benefit to that hundred plus million dollars is done, but at any rate, uh, it's dead for this session. The session is over, and uh, it's uh, one of these, well, wait again until next year. Mina, you agree with that? I mean, would you add anything to that? Um, it strikes me that there's no good reason for not passing that bill, no? Huh? Oh, there's plenty of good reasons for not passing the bill. The GEMS, the GEMS money was never meant to be a rebate program. That's, it's a loan program, it's a revolving loan program. And so I don't think the um, rate payer money should be used to support projects which benefit behind the meter. I mean, those are individual investments made only to um, right now because we don't have the right rate design um, benefit the person, be, uh, the, the, the customer side of the meter so I don't I didn't think it was appropriate for um, Jen's money to be used as a rebate yeah it was not intended for that second, yeah I see what you mean and secondly on energy storage yes um, 
you know, again, you, we have to, you know, that's, uh, that's again, another form of sub, subsidization. And, you know, there's always, there's already the current renewable um, energy income tax credit already allows for storage, you know, and, and I think a bill that's not properly fixed you're going to have the same people getting subsidized over and over and over again. Mm. So, you know, again, these are really important money issues that affect ratepayers and taxpayers. Uh, you know, the tax credit comes out of the general fund and, you know, the information coming forth about the impact of the general fund has been slow in coming. You know, there's like a two to three year lag to, to really look at the impact on the general fund and understand the impacts. Yeah, but well, was this, was the failure, I was talking specifically about the storage bill, was the failure of that bill due to, a, a, to policy considerations? Was it due to the, you know, the kinds of concerns you just expressed, Mina? Or was it due to the fact they just mm -hmm. couldn't get together? They, they couldn't get friendly, they couldn't make a deal, um, they, they couldn't work it out. And so for reasons that are not necessarily related to policy, the bill failed. Which one, which one was in play here? Well, I think it was both. I, I think, you know, uh, you know, hard policy decisions had to be made. And then, you know, the, the really decisive um, issue becomes the state budget and the impact on the state budget. Well, I remember uh, reading not too long ago, and Marco, you may remember the, the dollars involved, but the total cost of uh, energy credits, you know, just the solar credits over the past few years has been in the hundreds of millions. And I think maybe that makes some of the legislators, especially the money chairs, concerned about continuing to spend big money on it. Do you, do you remember the numbers? And am I right to assume that? Yeah, my recollection is, Jay, without having it right in front of me, is that uh, in uh, 2012, 2013, 2014, so three year period, the renewable energy tax credit ended up adding up to, for those three years, to close to a half a billion dollars, somewhere in the 500 million range. It's a lot of money. And uh, I remember back, I'm sure we all remember back to Act 221, um, you know, which went down in, uh, prem prematurely in 2010. Um, there was, it was a sore point for a lot of legislators. It was, um, you know, of great concern that we'd spend so much money uh, in, in incentivizing the technology uh, industry. Um, and in that case, I think the total amount of money was a lot less. It was more like 150 million. So um, this, must have, this must have bothered the money chairs simply by the size of, of the amount already spent. Um, but, you know, query, Marco, was that the reason, you think, or was it other things? Well, and this kind of leads me to a question I was going to pose to Mina, which uh, is, you know, looking from the political perspective, Mina, of course, was uh, chair of the House Energy and Environment Committee, the EAP, for a number of years. And she, I would think, uh, Mina, you interacted at least semi-regularly during the session with your counterpart on the Senate side, which, uh, oh gosh, it was Mike Gabbard amongst others, I think. And I was going to ask you, how important do you think it is that the uh, Energy and Environment Committee chair in the House and that the Energy uh, chair on the Senate, that they have regular contact and that they get along? Well, I, you know, I worked with, when I was chair of the House Energy and Environmental Protection Committee, I worked with several senators that came in and wrote, that were my counterparts on the Senate side. Um, you know, I, I believe I started off with Senator Inouye and Lorraine. Um, yes, um, Senator mm -hmm. Lorraine Inouye and then um, Senator Kalani English and um, and then Senator Mike Gabbard. I, I, I believe those are the three that I worked with. Um, and then also when he was Consumer Protection Chair, um, He's now a councilman, um, but at that time, Senator Ron Manor. And, you know, we, we worked quite well together. You know, we always look for common ground. And, and we did our homework prior to the session.
starting where, um, you know, we, we had a really good idea of what we wanted to accomplish um, uh, uh, during the session. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was a lot of discussion um, on bills and, and uh, massaging the bills as we went through along with the money committees to really understand um, budget impact, how much we could affect the budget um, as we move through. Well, we had a, a kind of a reflection of that in the relationship uh, after you left, the relationship uh, between Chris Lee and uh, Mike Gabbard as uh, chair of the House and um, Senate uh, Energy Committees. Um, but I mean, I'm interested in your thought about how it changed after you left and how it changed this year especially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think part of it is um, the issues are more difficult, definitely, and it, it takes a lot more um, work um, <laughs> to really look at um, the impact on the system. I mean, we're not, we're, you know, we're no longer looking at early adoption kinds of policies. Yeah. Um, you know, they're working on issues that are really, really complex. And so, you know, there's some concern on whether they should be dealing with a lot of issues um, in the legislature. You know, should it be going to the agency so there can be more analysis done? Um, so, you know, I, I kind of pose the question, um, are we really working on things at the legislature that that should be done in that arena? Yes. Um, well, one, one question I would put to you both is, uh, what do you think is going to happen next year? I mean, the two bills we've been focusing on here in the last few minutes has been the one that would um, the one that would um, uh, extend uh, the the credits uh, to um, I guess it's a, a newly uh, installed battery um, facilities and equipment, and the other um, is. Um, what about GEMS and using GEMS as a finance uh, tool um, going forward? And um, I'm wondering what you think about those bills for next year. You think it's an election year? Will they come back? What are their chances? What are the chances that the, you know, the problems that existed in the session, this session, um, you know, will, will, will remain next session? You know, Jay, I think what, what Mina just said to me makes for a very strong case of just how critically important it is to have legislators working cooperatively together. And the fact that she had collaborative, cooperative, friendly, according to what I think I just heard, uh, relationships uh -huh. with these various, these various energy committee chairs on the Senate side allowed for progress uh, and movement to take place. And from what I can tell, and maybe Mita can comment on this as well, uh, that type of, uh, shall we say, um, energy is uh, perhaps not as present uh, as we would wish it to be between the current chair of the uh, Environmental Energy and Environmental Protect Protection Committee, Chris Lee, and Senator Lorraine Inouye from, from my island. And I think uh, one could make the argument that uh, if that, in fact, is the case, that uh, kind of all of us end up suffering from uh, a relative uh, lack of a good, strong, friendly working relationship between two important, uh, obviously critically important individuals uh, on the uh, on the energy scene in our state. What would you add to that, Mina? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get. Well, what you know, you what said. strikes me is that you guys don't necessarily agree on the substance of the, of the, the bills. Um, and especially on the uh, on the storage bill. However, um, I think you know we need a way to do good policy uh, in the legislature, and um, you know to clear away um, um, you know all the things that detract from our ability to to think about policy. And and you know the the word is that for the last couple of years. 
Um, we haven't had the kinds of relationships between the Senate and the Energy, the Senate Energy and House Energy Committees uh, that would yield um, a kind of good, hard, uh, civil look at policy. And um, I guess the question is, is that going to change? Um, or are we going to have that going forward? Um, because whatever you, whatever you think about the policy that comes out of it, you want to be relatively confident that, that the policy is well processed and that the process is likely to lead to the best policy, don't you think? Well, I, you know, the, the thing is, we have a lot of good policies in place already. Right now, I think we're lacking leadership from, from the very top um, in directing um, where we're where we're headed, I mean that's not clear right now. I mean all we have is the soundbite, 100% renewable energy. But I, you know, I think the focus is on critical infrastructure, grid modernization, and um, you know. W w w we don't have a cohesive strategy. So it's not so much policy, it's the strategy, it's the implementation and the leadership that can take us there. You know, um, I, it, I, I, I know between myself and Jay, we've talked about this a lot, you yeah, know. Yeah. What, the, what the state is la lacking right now is some key infrastructure and modernization of some key infrastructure, one being the fuel um, infrastructure, another being telecommunications, and the, and the third one being um, the electric grid modernization. So, you know, it's, it's not about making policies or the small fixes or the small projects in the legislature. It, it's the fundamental foundational stuff that will get us to a clean energy future. Amen to that. that. That's at stake right now. A amen to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would offer this thought before our break, and that is if we have trouble making little policy, we are likely to have trouble, even more trouble, making big policy. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with uh, Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf uh, for a discussion of what happened in energy in the 2017 session. Some call it an apocalypse. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here, and my past blogs can be found at kauilucas.com. Okay, I didn't listen. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff. MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. It's uh, Marco Mina and me, Energy Apocalypse in 2017, now what? And it's Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar, Mina Morita uh, of Energy Dynamics, formerly a legislator for many years, decades, and uh, the chair of the PUC for, for the years after that. So um, I guess the real, the real interesting, if not dramatic, aspect of energy in the 2017 session is this really interesting failure, refusal of the Senate to confirm Tom Gorak an appointment made at the expiration of Mike Champley's uh, uh, term uh, back last June, July, whenever it was, uh, and it has waited until hmm, the end of the 2017 session for action um, by the legislature, and surprise of surprises, uh, it was declined. He didn't get confirmed. So the first question I put to you guys is, what happened? What happened? One word, Jay. Start for the P. Payback. <laughs> Payback. <laughs> so, so the, there's a really important issue here, you know, that there is a statute um, and there are two previous attorney general opinions which have stood for close to 40 years regarding holdover positions. And because the governor failed to timely submit a nominee during the legislative session, 
even though Mike Campy's term ended on June 30th, he, he was in a holdover position because um, PUC statute, I believe it's 269-2, states that um, the, the incumbent um, commissioner, the, the commissioner whose term expires, is held over until um, the nominee is appointed, I believe the word they use is appointed and qualified. And I, and I believe the term appointed and qualified means um, Senate confirmation. So the Senate's ability for advice and consent. So yeah. what happened was governor didn't send down a timely name um, during the last legislative session. June 30th came around and I believe he unlawfully removed Champley and installed Gorak. Hmm. And, and uh, um, just to mention that, should, that you have a lawsuit around these issues, which is pending and unresolved, and I realize you have to walk carefully in discussing the details of that suit. Right. So, so right now, the, the court ruled in Gorak's favor, the lower court, the circuit court ruled, Right now, we have an appeal in the Intermedi Intermediate Court of Appeals. Um, the state's answering brief was due, um, was filed on May 2nd, and we have um, 10 days to file a reply. Mm -hmm. And that's where it stands right and, now. And I'm sorry, what was that? That's where it stands right now. Yeah. And so um, I think during the break, uh, Marco had asked, you know, why isn't this moot? And so there's um, some argument about mootness in the briefs. And we believe that the issue is not moot when Gorak was not um, uh, reappointed because um, this affects the, the appointments overall overall nominations and appointments to the to all boards and commissions so not only the PUC is affected but mm -hmm. all boards and commissions are affected by um, how the governor changed the process so but I mean uh, in fact Tom Gorak is no longer on the table in fact his appointment um, you know is is over um, I think on Thursday. I believe. Say it again. Yeah. He he ha since he did he was not con confirmed. Um, he as soon as the legislature ended his term, interim term, supposedly ended. But you know, the question still has been has to be asked is whether he has been lawfully in that position to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, and that could affect uh, his participation in cases, I guess, and the validity of decisions made around that, theoretically. Well, so uh, we have, you know, part of our title is, what now? So what now with the PUC? What's going to happen here? Um, this, this, now we have a, a two-person PUC. The law says three. Uh, we have to have another appointment. It's likely to be an interim appointment and subject to confirmation next year in 2018. What's going to happen? Any ideas what David Ige is well, going to do? Well, I, I think, you know, that's the question, that's the question that needs to be asked, whether, um, whether Champley is still lawfully what they call a de jure officer. That's somebody who's legally entitled to the position, hmm. you know, and un until the court until the court weighs in. That's still a question that needs to be asked. Very interesting question. But if you were David Ige, yeah. if you were David Ige, you're probably going to appoint somebody else, somebody new. Has there any sound, if, any undercurrent about who he might appoint? No, but if I was, this is my advice to the administration. I mean, because I don't think they can attract anybody who wants to weigh into this controversy and, and, you know, wait a year with uncertainty to see if the Senate's going to appoint them or not. So my suggestion is 
he should put forward a nominee and um, put them through the confirmation process, ask the Senate to come back in special session and and um, uh, do advice and consent on his nominee. That's the cleanest way to do it. Do you think they would do that after uh, David Ige declined to make a special session on rail? Well, they do it for judicial appointments. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing new to come back for a day to um, do advice and consent on a nominee. Wouldn't that open up the whole rail thing, though, since they had a special... Once you have a special session, it's like um, you have to handle everything that's, 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 that's in play, don't you? Well, this is, this is, you know, the Senate can come back on its own without the House. Mm. If they're going to deal with something like rail, both houses have to come back yes. and act. Yes. But, so, but with advice and consent, only the Senate needs to come back. So, Marco, you know, what, what now in terms of how this is going to affect uh, energy, the, you know, our effort to uh, reach 100% by 2045 or earlier? Uh, all the issues that are in play, um, you know, in the industry, all the questions that have to be resolved in the many dockets. How is this going to be affected by having, you know, this consternation at the PUC level? Well, I think, you know, without getting too graphic, we're somewhere uh, we're somewhere up the creek, Jay. And to what extent we have paddles to get down downstream kind of is, uh, is the more problematic now because we're down to two commissioners, Randy Awase and Lorraine Akiba. The third commissioner is a person unknown. What will that man or woman bring in terms of being able to hit the ground running, if not sprinting? And uh, as we've talked about so many times, I mean, the, 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 the breadth and depth of what's before the PUC right now is, uh, is pretty broad and pretty deep. So it just gives me a concern that these decisions that have to be cranked out on these various critical dockets to what extent are they going to be delayed? To what extent is the process uh, kind of screwed up right now because of just two commissioners? I mean, obviously, Mina has you know, been living and breathing, was living and breathing, being a commissioner, chair of the commissioner for a number of years. So I would you know, put it to her, Mina, to what extent do you think that uh, the commission is going to be uh, kind of handicapped in the months to come doing what it needs to do? I don't see the commission as handicapped. They can act with two commissioners. They just have to, they just have to um, agree on on any decision and order. So, you know, commission can go on with two commissioners, um, provided they come uh, come in with a, a, a unanimous agreement on uh, on an order. And you know, mm -hmm. for the most part, there's very little. Um, disagreement amongst the commissioners. The, the real question is the commission staffing and whether the commission has um, staff capacity to move forward on all of these issues. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of the Supreme that's, Court that's, when we, we had only eight uh, justices uh, last year and uh, somehow they managed through on the other hand, when they, they couldn't reach um, you know, um, a majority vote, uh, they, they put it off, they put it over. And that's probably what will happen when the two remaining commissioners uh, can't reach agreement. They'll just put it over rather than have a you know, one against one, one, <laughs> one majority, one minority position. Well, anyway, we're out of time, you guys. I wish we had more time, but we are at the end of our show. We've enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm Jay Fidel. Our guests have been Marco Mangelsdorf uh, and uh, Mina Morita. We've been talking about remarkable things in the legislative session, addressing the issue of whether this was a good year or not for energy in the legislature. Thanks to our production engineer, uh, Robert McLean, our uh, floor manager, Ray Sangalang, and all the people who care and contribute to our Think Tech productions. If you want to see this show again, go to thinktechhawaii.com and youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, where there'll be a link to more shows just like this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Aloha. And thanks, you guys. Thank you, Jay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Aloha. Jay. Thanks, Jay.